The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. One of the observations about near-death reports, uh, many have noted, is the ubiquitous nature of a spiritual being often identified as Jesus. I say ubiquitous because many members of other faiths, or no faith at all, will often describe meeting, along with deceased relatives and angels, a being who they say, I just knew it was Jesus. Sometimes he looked like the pictures of earthly Jesus with long hair and a white robe. Sometimes he's more light than human looking. Nevertheless, these NDEers have no question about it. Christian, Jew, Muslim, or atheist, they name him and are humbled by the intensity of his love for them. Perhaps that quote from John, no one comes to the Father except through me, is being fulfilled on the other side as well. Our guest today, Santosh Adjarji offers another uniquely different version of such an experience. Santosh, known as Sandy, was born and raised in India to an Orthodox Hindu family. Although his father was a Hindu priest and renowned Sanskrit scholar, Sandy says that he himself was not seriously religious, although he always believed in God and that everything was created by someone but he was busy with his high-tech career as a manufacturing engineer in Germany, Canada, Brazil, all around the world, and finally in America. That is, until he experienced a code blue in the ICU of a hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. In his book, My Encounter with Jesus at Heaven's Gates, Sandy describes how he unexpectedly departed this world for a period of three days and three nights to an NDE with Jesus that transformed him completely. Sandy believes he learned from his NDE who we are, the real purpose of our life here on Earth, and what is expected from us. Sandy, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you. Thank you. It's really great to have you here. Um, Sandy, uh, few people in this country know anything about the Hindu religion. So if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions about the religion you were first born into, going back to... Uh, the Indus Valley, 4000 BC, that you mentioned in your book. And I was going to say, heaven, hell, and angels that appear in the Hindu religion, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah, we actually Hindus believe there's a trinity. There's one. The trinity consists of Father, the Creator, and his name is Brahma. Yes. And then the second trinity is Father the Preserver. His name is Vishnu. And the third trinity is, is, is Father the Destroyer, which is, have, his purpose is to destroy. Yes. And that's, that's Shiva, isn't it? That's Shiva. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Now, is Shiva considered a, an evil being like we think of Satan or Lucifer? In well, that he's right. a destroyer? Right now, you know, when I grew up, Shiva was another uh, powerful god. Okay? Mm. Now, in Hinduism, you can actually follow any of those. Uh, you don't have to go to the one main thing. You can be like a Hindu just believing in something else, but you still can be a Hindu. Okay? Mm. There's no unified, uh, what I should say, direction that we need to go to okay so that's that's how i grew up then hindus also believed under the three you know the three three what i should say main ones there mm-hmm. the millions, primary gods yeah primary god there are millions and millions of other gods okay so gods and goddesses okay mm-hmm. so that's also they believe in in many gods and goddesses and there are like hundreds of millions of them, aren't there? Yes, I think if I recollect, you know, I'm not an expert in the religion, but I think they believe in 330 million gods and goddesses. Wow. Yeah. 
Now we uh, Christians uh, talk about millions of angels. Is there? Is, do you suppose there's a similarity between the between the two? Right now, no, no, they also have angels separately. So I don't think that angels that someone that they would worship or we would worship. No, they mm-hmm. don't do that. Although they believe they have superior power than us, but we do we don't worship them. Okay. And then Brahma is the chief god, and he exists forever, Brahma, ever, forever. Brahma would be like the father in our, you know, in a Christianity. Mm. His father, he is God the Father. Okay. And then, I think in your book you said all else is Maya illusion. The, tell us about that. Well, in their religion, they did say that no one can come to the Father. No one. So Father is, is nobody can reach to him. Hmm. So, and the only way we can probably ever reach to him is, is by repeated reincarnations, by perfecting hmm. ourselves, and and also being under the guidance of a spiritual guru or something, maybe we can we can get to know the father that that we know in our Christianity. Mm-hmm. But in in general practices, no, he is not reachable by any one of us. So it'd be a very rare soul uh, that that makes it to uh, merge with uh, uh, with Brahma. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, the soul reaches through reincarnation, hopefully the soul reaches, uh, I think it's moksha. Moksha, yeah. That's yeah the, which is that's salvation. Salvation, yeah. That's, and, that's, that's, yeah. And, and now that's with the great soul. Now, you saw a divine giant lord of pure light. We're going to get to that. But do you see a similarity between the two? Well, at that time, I did not know the difference. Okay. I did not know the difference between God the Father and God the Son, and I did not know any difference. Okay, so I thought that when I die, that would be is is done. I'm done with this life, and what happens if there is an afterlife? What happens to me is beyond our control. It would be up to the up to the Almighty. Mm. Now, your father was a, a priest. What were his duties as a priest? Well, he was actually a Sanskrit scholar. Sanskrit, uh-huh. Sanskrit is um, is actually where many, many of these Indian religions, they actually came from that, you know, original Sanskrit. Mm-hmm. And some also these days believe that there's a connection between the Sanskrit and the German language, okay? I really didn't dig there into that too much, but they are interconnected. So, wow. So I would think um, Sanskrit would have uh, pre-existed uh, German for sure. Wasn't uh, is the Mahabharata written in Sanskrit? Yes, yes. That's all the Indian, you know, the holy books. Yes, and most of them are written in Sanskrit. Yeah. And we read when I was in school at, at Columbia. We read some of the contents, and some of it sounds like a, a prehistory of a technological civilization with flying machines and nuclear weapons and nuclear war. I mean, it's some dramatic passages that sound just like something out of Hiroshima. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is fascinating. Even today, it fascinates the people who actually wrote them thousands of years ago, Mm. they had this concept of these, uh, like today's uh, planes and, you know, that helicopters in different forms. Okay. So those things, you know, it's it's really mind boggling. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a sort of a fundamental difference of timeline between Christian and, and Hindu in that the Hindus see great cycles massive millions of year cycles. And so you could have had high tech civilizations that managed to destroy themselves. And we go back to the cave era and then we're back into building up civilizations again. 
Whereas in the Christian history, we sort of see it as a straight timeline from the Big Bang to it's the creation of the Bible to Revelation, which is the end of days in the Bible. It's a very different construct in the way to see the universe, as far as I can tell. Yeah, like for myself, I never, you know, never paid any interest to any of them. So I'm not an expert in this. There are some people they do. My father would be like more qualified than anybody I can think of to to talk about it. Okay. Yes. I am. My interest went into different areas, so I am. I was, I was totally away from from what my father knew. <laughs> was he uh, interested in your being a, a a faithful Hindu when he when you were growing yes, up? He, he, since you know, I am the eldest son in the family. Ah. I find. Those days, I did not know much about the Jewish family. Mm -hmm. Because now that I know a little bit more about Jewish families, it looks like the Jewish family's tradition and the Hindu family tradition exactly identical. Ah. Except, you know, they believe in one God and what the Hindus believe is gods and goddesses. Other than that, we have a very much similarity in our culture. Was there a uh, bar mitzvah for you as a young man? Uh, what, what what the Jews would call a bar mitzvah, or what we would call a confirmation? Uh, well, yes, very identical. Like, you know, many things are identical. Like, you know, they, on the seventh day or the eighth day, they have, like, when the new son is born, there is some kind of a, you know, you know, the celebration that goes on. Very mm-hmm. identical to what they have. Yes. And then also the the culture that the, the entire family live together is very, that's the way it used to be old days. Even when I grew up, you know, like my father and his, and his uh, brothers and sisters, they're all together, you know, in one family. Mm-hmm. And the, the marriage, marriage of the, you know, Jewish families, you know, daughters is very identical to Hindu family's daughters. So there's a lot of similarities between the two cultures. Hmm. Did your parents come to America with you? Well, I invited them. My father didn't want to. Hmm. My mother wouldn't mind come visiting me because, but she could not travel alone. So, only way she could travel, somebody would bring her back here and take her back. Yes. So, no, they never came. Uh, I guess the only big difference in modern Christianity, uh, or at least the majority of modern Christians and, and the Hindu faith, is the notion of reincarnation. About 25% of Christians believe in reincarnation, but it's not the mainstream thinking on the subject. And, of course, in, in the Hindu tradition, it is. Growing up, did you hear stories, maybe from other children, about past lives? Well, yeah, that's time to time, you know, it comes in the newspaper and other things. But, you know, I really didn't pay much attention. The only one thing that really surprised me is when when I physically died in the hospital. Mm-hmm. I had the code blue and they tried to revive me, but they could not. So, and I described those in the book too. So what really surprised me, I thought when I died, that's it. But then after my death, I found out that's not it. I'm still alive. Yes. <laughs> I'm still alive because my physic, my body died. But everything that God gave me, my intellectual powers and everything, my thinking, my vision, everything is still there. Okay, well, let's move on to that. Let me summarize from your book for the listening audience. In October of 2006, you went to the hospital with severe chest pain, thinking it might be a heart attack. Turned out gallstones had ruptured, causing your pancreas to start bleeding out. Plus, you had pneumonia and you were dying. And your heart rate was so fast, the doctors said there was nothing they could do for you. And you say in your book, you're lying there thinking, and and you'd had this long and successful engineering career, but you were lying there thinking, what good is it? 
all my success in the world, what good is it? Is that about right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I was, I was like one of the, you know, I had a good career. I had a good prospect. I was making good money, good traveling, that everything that someone in my field of dream of, I had it, right? And yes. everything was going in the right direction. I had so many projects and I had, I'm not bragging it, but I'm just with his, with the blessings of the Lord. I had successes in every project that I took. Mm. And that's what gave me some reputation, also money and also prestige or whatever you want to call. But what good is it? What good is it when I'm in the hospital and I want to leave and they say they can do anything? I think we all, at some point in our lives, face that question, don't we? All the things we thought were going to earn us credit in heaven, those aren't the important things at no, all. they're not important at all. Yeah. Now, you, you say in your book you had an inner voice. You heard an inner voice that told you you were dying. Tell us about yeah. that inner voice. What, what was that like? The inner voice really surprised me when they were like, well, they took me for, a, you know, like a, draining out the, they want to drain out the lungs. My lungs had some fluids, but they did draining out of the one lungs. But in, in the process that something went wrong, not intentionally, I think medically they did something wrong. And they actually punctured the main artery that goes into my lungs. Oh, my God. So the, as a result, it was bleeding. Mm. And my lungs got filled up with blood. So I could not breathe anymore. That's what actually caused my code blue. Okay. Yes. Wow. And then at that time, when they were taking me upstairs, I even asked the RN, did everything go well? And she said, yes. But we want to make sure I'll take an x-ray before I can take you up. We can take you upstairs. Mm. So after the x-ray, I asked the RN, did everything go okay? And she said, yes, nothing to worry. Mm. But as they were taking me upstairs in the elevator, an inner voice came to me and said, your life is coming to an end. And that really shocked me, you know, who is talking to me, you know. And it's coming over and over. He said, your life is coming to an end. You don't have much time to live. And that continued, that voice, until the things actually happened. It kept repeating. So then I don't know what that inner voice came from, but it was warning me that your life is going to be ended soon. Some would say it was a guardian angel, perhaps your guardian angel telling you. It's possible. You say in the book, you had a chance to say goodbye to your wife, Jarna? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and give your blessing to the family? Yes, at the time it happened, you know, my wife was there. And my son came, he used to live in north of Detroit. And he came with his wife and also I had a granddaughter, they all came to visit me. Mm. So I had the opportunity to give my final blessings to them. And when actually it happened, I was actually touching my wife's forehead, giving her the blessings. I've been telling them, take care of each other, love one another. And at that time, I collapsed right on the bed. Wow. And, and that, then that that's interesting because that's one of the things when we get to it that God said you should do is to give your love to your family. Hmm. And then after I collapsed, all my senses, I was touching my wife's forehead, giving her the blessings. I couldn't feel the touch. It's gone. I was watching her. I could not see. I was talking to her. I could not talk. It looks like all my sense is gone, except the sense of hearing. The sense of hearing I had for quite some time. I don't know how long, but quite some time, because I heard through the hearing, I could see, or I could hear that the RN came to the room and announced code blue, code blue. 
room number this is code blue code blue okay i did not know what the code blue meant at the time and then a little bit later i hear a lot of footsteps in my room they actually drove everybody out okay mm. including my family and then they took over i did not know what they are doing i only last thing i remember one doctor is telling the other doctor we are rapidly losing him he is not responding at all and the other doctor said we just lost him and after that i went into a darkness i could not hear nothing all my senses are gone everything went dark but then was it shortly thereafter that this bright light came to you that's the time that i noticed that i am not dead my oh. body is dead oh that's right you had an out of body experience you saw your body yes. didn't you i wow. see my physically i am dead but i am still alive the reason i'm saying at the time i had these emotions or feelings that i would have i lost my home what am i going to do now mm. that's like a you know is like a feeling of losing everything okay helplessness yeah. and then at that time i saw a bright light appeared before me the light was so bright and when he came near me he engulfed me with his radiance okay so that's the result i could not see anything but i could see when it and god me i could see my dead body is still lying on that hospital bed okay and i am out of the body so that's uh, after the light took me over i knew when the light came i knew that that light had a superior authority i have to obey mm. i i could not disobey his uh, or the lights whatever he wants to do and then together we travel for quite some time i don't know how long yes i think you in the book you say he he drew you like a magnet drawn yes, a piece he, of metal he just took me like a magnet i had no power okay? <laughs> i'm under his control okay and then sometimes i remember that we went through some dark tunnels the reason i'm saying that is because i am engulfed with with the light have you ever taken a train ride and sometimes the train goes to the tunnel yes it's the same kind of feeling okay yeah so that you know that i'm going through a tunnel everything's different okay but after that once the tunnel went through everything back to where it was before that's why i that's why i'm saying that we went to some dark tunnel but during the transition i fell in love with this divine light okay the reason i'm saying that because i knew that divine light that was taking me it has a mission and whatever it wants to do is good for me i have no control over it but he he meant protection for me as long as he's taking me i am okay i'm safe so that's what was my experience there i guess you were moving at a great speed from what you said in the book yes it was a great speed i have oh. no idea how fast it went but it was a great speed and was it up did you feel like you were going away from the earth and in an upward direction i have no because i was surrounded with this light hmm. moving at a fast speed but i don't know which way is taking me <laughs> is it up or north or which is what the reaction is taking me yeah. i have no i have no clue but together we travel for quite some time and then at the end the light stopped when the light stopped i had to stop i had no other no other choice yes and then when the light stopped i was wondering why did the light stop hmm. why is it moving why we've been moving so along but why is not going any further then i 
saw that light was shining on top of a beautiful, magnificent compound. Most beautiful compound that I've ever seen anywhere. And then light was shining on top of that compound. And then when I looked up, where you stop, I saw that compound, many, many beautiful mansions, mansions after mansions. Is is like unbelievable. And it's also surrounded with high walls, very high walls. And it's all like a protected area because that first time I saw there inside, there were many, many angels. The angels, their job was to protect this territory, wherever it took me. And then I counted, I looked at all around there. I wanted to go desperately inside because I knew if I go inside the territory, my life's mission is over. Okay. I knew that. But how do I get in there? I looked all around there. I said, 12 magnificent gates, but every one of them was closed for me. None of them was open. And I desperately wanted to go there, but I could not. So but not being able to go there, it made me sad. And I, I definitely wanted to go, and I wished that there was an alternative. But there was no alternative in my sight at the time. So then I was not being able to go. I was concentrating on the area. Where am I? What is this place that I'm standing? It looks like I'm standing on some place. Okay. Even though my body was not there, it felt like I'm standing. So I Looked at the area, I was standing on a huge platform. That platform was 1,000 feet long, roughly, and about 250 feet wide. A very, very big platform. And I was standing at the extreme left-hand edge of that platform. And from where... It looks like I'm on a higher altitude. From there, I could fall down. So I was thinking if I fall down, where am I going to fall? So I looked on my left, and what I saw down below scared scared me completely. Because what I'm going to fall is, is it, is it enormous depth, and it was all dark. It's like dark dungeon world. And that wall that where I was standing is all abyss. You know what abyss means is if I fall, I can never climb up. Okay. Yes. And when I fall down there, the only light there is a burning lake of fire. So from where I was standing, I fall, I'll fall into that burning lake of fire. And that really scared me. And I immediately tried to move couple of feet away from there. And then I was sad. I was sad because, you know, I'm at a spot. I want to go forward inside that beautiful compound that I can see, but all the gates are closed. I could not go back to where I came from. That's a no-no. I did not have that Opportunity, like the Hindus believe that there is a reincarnation, I did not have that opportunity. The only option I had was to fall on my left into the deep dungeon, dark world, into the, into the burning lake of fire. The kind of vision you're describing, I've heard from other NDEers, that it's like 360 degree and you can see forever, you can see up close and you can see great distances. Was it like that? Yeah, I could see like enormous distance. And I think I also mentioned in my book that when we are there, we have a different vision 
our vision on this earth is very limited. We can only see so far, and even for us to see, things have to be bright. Things have to be within our, within our visual distance. But over there, we have enormous vision. We can see from one end to the other end without any obstructions. And we can also, not only you can see, you can also zoom in like a powerful camera can do these days. Yes. Like if I see somebody, I can zoom in their faces and see if I know somebody. So we have that, we'll have that capability over there. And then I was at a spot that I, I had no, no way to go forward. I had no way to go backward where I came from. Only option I had was to fall into that lake of fire. Now, in your book, you said the light that brought you was carefully watching your your every move. What what was that about? Well, like you know, when I, I was at the extreme left edge, and I moved two feet, three feet away from there, he was watching me. What I'm doing? <laughs> was was it to protect you from falling, or what do you think? No, it's just probably just. Just curious what is he doing you know why is uh, he moving <laughs> two three feet away from this edge you know? so it's more or less like it was, it was it was a frightening for me that yes that he's watching me you know and then there was no way i could go back or i could go forward i could only fall down below mm. that made me very sad and I think in your book, you said you, you looked into the city to see if you could see the faces of friends or family. Yes. Deceased. My first reaction was, you know, when I had the capability of zooming in the faces, I was seeing some people there. I zoomed in their faces. Just my first reaction was whether my parents are there, whether I somebody I know. but. Unfortunately, I did not see anybody that that I recognized. That made me very sad. You know what I thought when I read that was, perhaps we have a choice according to our faith. Perhaps they had reincarnated. I do not know. I do not know what happened to them. I'm still, every day I pray for them. Every day. I don't know where they are. I know they're good people. They're very honest people. They knew they were very religious. So whatever happens, God, please have mercy on them. Please have mercy on them. And please take care of them. Well, then there was something else on the platform, wasn't there? Yes. Tell that, us about that. So not knowing like what to do, I was trying to concentrate on this platform, what is this platform, huge platform. And then I was starting to look at the center of that platform. There was like an altar with three steps, those three giants, gigantic steps for me. And on the, on the top of this, of the altar, there was a huge throne. And it did look to me seemed to me that somebody was sitting there. So I looked up, and when I looked up, I saw there, the Lord Almighty is sitting there. I only looked at his face once because his face was so frightening to me, as if he was angry, and he means... He was going to punish me for all the wrong things that I did. And every wrongful thing that I did in my life, everyone was flushed before my eyes. Some of them I forgot, but when I watched them, then yes, I remember I did, I did commit those wrongful things. But I, was, I could not look at his face for the second time because shame and guilt took over me. I started to tremble. I knew at 
any moment, the Lord Almighty is going to ask me to dive down. I was trembling. I was looking at his feet continuously for his begging for his mercy. And I kept repeating the same thing over and over. Lord, please, please forgive me. Please forgive me for my sins, Lord. Please forgive me. I did not know what I was doing. I did not know what all the things that I've done. I should not have done that. Please have mercy on me. So I kept repeating the same thing. And But I knew at any moment the Lord is going to ask me to, to jump down or dive down. Mm. When I was... When I was expecting for the worst, the Lord spoke to me. He said to me, what are you doing here? I shrugged my shoulder, meaning I don't know. Then he said, I am sending you back to the earth. Go back and complete your unfinished tasks. When the time comes, I'll see you again. When I was looking at his feet, when the Lord spoke to me, I felt the compassion and the grace and the love in his voice. He has mercy. I could feel that. And then when I was looking at his feet, slightly on his left, right on the platform level, I saw a very tiny narrow door or narrow gate. And through that narrow door, I could see the entire kingdom of heaven. And I felt like running through that narrow door. But I am five foot six inches and the Lord is sitting in front of me. He's a huge giant, mighty giant. How can I dare to run through that gate? It doesn't happen. The only way you can go to the door is only if he lets you in. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. So I was looking at the narrow door and I started pleading to the Lord, Lord, please, please help me. When I'm back to the yard, please tell me which church you want me to go, which temple you want me to join, which mosque, which synagogue, or which any other religious institute that, that you want me to join. I asked him several times, but he did not respond. And then, Finally, he said, those things are not important to me. That really shocked me. Because I thought the more religious a person is, the closer to God he is. But God himself is saying, those things are not important to me. I was confused, he said. I want to see your relationship with me. I want to see how true, how sincere, how honest you are with me all the time, not just once a week or whenever you want. All the time I want to see, are you sincere? Are you true? Are you honest with me? I was confused. It's all the things that I knew, because I knew that my parents were very good religious people. Very good, very honest. But the Lord is saying they're not important. I want to see if you are if you have a good relationship with me all the time. So I started pleading to the Lord, Lord, I am a simple human being. Please tell me what exactly I need to do when I go there. After repeated pleadings, he said, when you are back to the earth, I want you, it's like an order. I want you to love your family and love your children. So that's mm -hmm. the very first guidance or not only guidance, it's like a, it's a commandment that he gave. Not only for me, for anyone in this world, that we must love our families and we must love our children. It's very simple it is, but it's 
is very hard. If you look at today's world, you will see that has, where is the society is falling apart. Yes. Husbands don't love their wives, wives don't love their husbands, children don't love their parents, parents don't love their children. And that's the commandment that very first thing he says, love your family and love your children. Then he also gave me some instructions. Yes. Uh, well, there are five altogether, weren't there? Five instructions he gave. The first instruction he gave to me is always tell the truth. Always. Do not be afraid to tell the truth. Some people will look down upon you when you tell the truth. But do not despair. Always tell the truth. Now, when he says tell the truth, to me, it has two meanings to me. First meaning is do not tell lies. And the second meaning is tell the truth means what you are witnessing in front of you. What are you witnessing on your left? On your, where are you going to fall? And where you are, you cannot go back to the where you came from. Share this truth. Share this truth, what you're seeing here. This beautiful compound in front of you. And there is only one narrow door there, the narrow gate that you enter in there, through there. Share this with the whole world. Share with the others. Second instruction is told me is, the wages of sin is death. From this day on forward, commit no more sins. So I took... That's a tough order, isn't it? I, <laughs> I take it like from this day on forward, when you say it, that means he, he forgave my sins up to that point. Okay? All the sins that was flushed in, in front of my eyes that he showed me, those things are probably forgiven. From this day on forward, he doesn't want me to commit any more sins. It's a hard one. Mm. Because very basic things that we learn in this world is how to tell lies, not to tell the truth. Mm. I myself was guilty about that. I've told many lies. But ever since I came back, to this life, from that encounter, I have not said any more lies since then. I try not to. I do not tell any more lies. It's a very basic thing in our in our life. If everyone would do that, we could heal society overnight. Exactly. Exactly. The, that's the lies that are bringing us down. It's not only in personal life. Also, you take it in a bigger sense up to this country you know the entire yes. country is run by because of a lot of lies yes but we need to go back to the basic we need to start changing ourselves one at a time every person by themselves do not tell lies try, try to tell the truth the lord is saying the wages of sin is death so then the next instruction that he gave me is Always, always surrender myself completely to him in yeah. my daily life. Mm. Completely should be underlined. It's a powerful thing to think of. You know, it's the sort of thing that a, a monk might attempt to do. But for a, someone in ordinary life, it's a complete change <laughs> in your ego to be able to do something like that. Because we always like to do it ourselves. Yeah. Just the way we think. Just so we, we think it's right, that's what we'll do. Yeah. But he wants to be the driver in our life. Okay? He wants to be the driver in my life. And the next instruction is completely foreign to me. I did not understand at all because he said, walk with me. I did not understand because I'm, like I mentioned, I'm five foot six inches. <laughs> and what I'm witnessing him there when he stood up, would be at least 70, 75 feet tall. 
So how can I walk with him? Is one step would be like running a race for me, just to catch up with one step. I did not understand the meaning of that for a long time until later on when I knew that walk with me means walk in the direction that the Lord wants to go. If the Lord wants to go forward, I'm going backward or I'm going sideways, right or left, and we are not walking together. And I took that to mean love. The path of love would be walking with God. Yes. And the final instruction that he gave me is always be kind to the poor, be generous to the poor. They need your help. That instruction was so important that he told me that twice. Hmm. Always be kind, be generous to the poor. Now, in this world, when you talk about be generous to the poor, normally we think that people need financial help only. Not only so, people could be poor in many ways. They could be mentally poor, educationally poor, emotionally poor, physically poor, in many different ways. But in today's world, what you see is most people, even the people that go to churches all the time, they're spiritually poor. They don't know the Lord. They don't surrender to him. They don't walk with him. So we can enrich them by offering our compassion as well as our money. Right. Yeah. That's beautiful. So that's basically what I experienced now. The Lord spoke to me for quite some time. I don't know exactly what time, but we have, it seems like he spoke to me after that on other things. And one of the things that he asked me is to write two books. And I did write those two books. But he also told me not to take one penny from these book sales. It should be all donated to the poor. So, yes, I did write two books with his help, with his guidance. And these two books have been combined now into one book, it's my encounter with Jesus at Heaven's Gates is available in Amazon and also Barnes and Noble and other places. So, but every penny that that I get from these, they go to help the poor. That's great. So that's basically what happened. I did not know at the time that it was Jesus talking to me. It took me several years. Okay. When he was talking to me at the time, I took it literally as God was speaking to me. And then it bothered me. After I came back, I went back to my job and I had few responsible assignments. The first assignment that I got was in China. After that is finished, then my next assignment was in India. And that was traveling, you know, I was traveling back and forth quite often. But it kept bothering me. What did I witness? What does the narrow door mean? Right? Why couldn't I go to these uh, 12 gates that I witnessed? Why they were all closed for me? What does it, all this mean? I didn't know. And the other thing that bothered me in our Hindu scripture says that you cannot come to God directly. It's, it's not possible for a human being to, to have an encounter with God. So, but, the, but the person or the God that I met, he was God. He was God Almighty. So how is it possible? Why didn't I not witness a God or goddesses or whatever that, that I knew? That was bothering me for a long time. And I could not speak to anybody. Nobody would listen. Nobody could explain. At work, we are not supposed to discuss that kind of topics. But it got it. So finally, I started to meditate on on the on 
on the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. And slowly, slowly, he revealed that to me. I came to this church as um, it's a great church in Middle Bar Heights, Ohio, for the very first time through my daughter, who was going to perform in that in one of the Easter services, I believe it was 2010. And she was invited by one of her friends to join the choir group. So we came to witness. And this is the first time I came to attend any church services for Easter anywhere. And the very first sermon that the senior pastor here, his name is Jonathan Schaefer. He was preaching that day. His very first sermon was a narrow door. <laughs> narrow gate. Jesus, oh, things Jesus. never happen by coincidence. They just... Uh... No, it, it, it didn't happen by coincidence. I was, I was struggling with it. Why is a narrow door? I could have run through this narrow door inside the heaven. I wanted to when I was there, but I could not dare. So what does narrow door means? And yet Jonathan was exclusively as if he was talking to me. What does narrow door mean? So that really drew my interest. I started, I started reading those scriptures that he was he was preaching that day, and after that, I started coming to the church more often, and gradually the Lord explained everything to me what I witnessed. Everything. Yeah. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And How, I, I, I wanted to ask you, when you first came back, there's a, you talk in your book about a, a very kind motherly nurse, and you told yeah. her about what you'd seen. Tell us yeah. about that. Yes, because when I came back, like I went away from this world on 21st of October, 2006. I think the timing would be about, you know, my code blue happened around 2 p.m. around that time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how long they're trying to revive me and all these things. Maybe I don't know exactly. <clears throat> Sometime in the afternoon. But I came back, and from that day, from that time on till I came back, I had no clue what happened here. Everything I I knew is after I came back is from my doctor and the medical team, or speaking to my wife and somebody else, right? And uh, but I had no recollection of things that happened in this world during that period. But I mean, even today, I still remember every second what happened outside. Even today, those things are not gone. They're mm -hmm. permanently in my, in, my, in my brain. You encountered a, a motherly type nurse who was sitting well, by your bed. Yes. And, yes. and you told so, her about, about what you'd seen. 21st of October, I went from here. And according to the to the medical report, I came back in that hospital October 24, 2006, in the morning, mm. around early morning, some 7, 7.30, something like that. So uh, during these three days, I have no idea what they've been doing. When I opened my eyes, I remember seeing a motherly type nurse. Motherly type means is very kind, very merciful, very compassionate lady was looking at me. As if is. And she's, when I woke up my eyes, she said, oh, thanks God, you're back. You're back here. Mm. Yes. I said, where am I? What's this place? I was just talking to God. And he said, I'll listen to it later. Everyone here will be very excited to know this, 
to know this that you are back, okay? Let me go and tell them. He will be so excited. Praise the Lord. And and she ran away. She went to the, to the other. So I was dozing on and off when I came back. Next thing I hear is a bunch of footsteps in my, in my, uh, in that room. And they were all excited that I'm up. And then after a few days, I talked to one of the nurses. Is remember when I came back, there was a nurse here. Can I speak to that nurse? Oh, certainly, certainly. We'll go back and, you know, look at who was at the time. So we will bring him back. So this was a motherly type lady. And they brought it back to me, a young girl. And she was on duty. And when I looked at her, I said, no, that's not her. It's because it's a motherly. I still remember her face. And they went back and checked all the records. Nobody in the description was there. So that's still a mystery to me. So who was that lady that, that talked to me? The only thing I can think of, it was an enormous distance that when I traveled with the divine light, I could not make the journey by myself. So maybe it's somebody else need to bring me back. Maybe I'm, I'm not sure. That's the, just still a mystery to me. Uh, that she might have been an angel Ooh. in disguise. Only God knows. Yeah. Well, Santosh, we're out of time for today. Um, and I really want to thank you so much for sharing your story, your amazing story. Um, your books are combined in uh, My Encounter with Jesus at Heaven's Gate, Gates, and um, you wrote those two books that God asked you to write, and then you combined them, which is makes it easy for folks, and uh, I, I enjoyed reading them. Um, and, and I should note, again, that all proceeds from the sale of the book go to the poor, which is terrific. So if uh, listeners would like to get a copy of your book, you had said it's available through Amazon? Yes, Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Okay. And uh, before I forget, I want to thank your pastor, Steve Harper, <laughs> who has thank helped you. us with this Zoom connection. And Santosh, uh, bless you, man. You're, you're, this has been an amazing story. And uh, the uh, the requirement God asked of you and of us that we never sin again. Uh, we're, we're counting on his mercy and his love. <laughs> and well, if is, we, if we're trying hard enough, I think he'll probably. Uh, it is difficult not to commit sins in this world. It's difficult because we live in an environment. But the thing is that the minute we know that we committed sins is ask for the forgiveness, ask yes. for his forgiveness. Okay. And my take on it is that he is asking us to ultimately love him and love one another as he does to us. And if we accomplish that, then the sins are going to just disappear of their own accord. You know, they just, they'll be where love exists. There isn't any sin. And ultimately that's heaven, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, this, is, this has been a blessing for us and for our listeners. So thank you again. If listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 450 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.